Hi there, this is Dr. John Bergsma from the St. Paul Center for Biblical Theology and Franciscan University of Steubenville. And here we are on Friday of the 14th week of Ordinary Time. So, before I forget, don't you forget to subscribe to these uh, broadcasts and also hit that notification bell uh, so you get alerts when we come out with fantastic new material that you would not want to miss. If you do that, that helps us out quite a bit to get these uh, productions uh, more widely distributed, etc., and build our base, all that good stuff, and it's absolutely free for you to do. So please do that. Subscribe and hit the notification bell. So we are here on the 14th week of Ordinary Time, and in our first reading in the lectionary for Mass, we are working through the book of Genesis, and we're getting to the end of Genesis. We are almost at the end of the beautiful book of origins uh, in Scripture. And, of course, in our uh, gospel, we're working through um, the gospel of Mark right now as we are in the middle of the liturgical year in the weekly cycle. So we have an interesting combination of readings today. Genesis 46, um, some excerpts uh, about how now Jacob, who is very elderly, and has not been a major player in the action for the last uh, dozen and a half chapters. Uh, he now becomes the focus of the narrative once more as uh, Jacob, who is also named Israel, okay, from which we get the name of the people Israel. Okay, so Jacob Israel is coming down from Canaan to Egypt to be reunited with his son Joseph. And he worships God on the way. God appears to him in a dream at night and reassures him that he's going to die a peaceful death and Joseph will be there uh, to console him at his death. And, uh, and then Jacob arrives uh, in Egypt and he is re reunited with his son Joseph, who for decades he thought had been dead. And it's a tear-jerking scene of father and son embracing one another and being reconciled and reunited. And uh, they weep and they weep. It's a very tear-jerking scene of the movie. And then Israel says to Joseph at the end, at last I can die now that I've seen for myself that Joseph is still alive. So very sweet reconciliation between father and son here at the end of Genesis, um, a happy resolution to what has been a very painful, very heart-rending story of betrayal and presumed death and uh, slavery and being framed for a crime and all kinds of uh, terrible things. But in the providence of God, it comes out all right at the end. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I just get so emotional about these stories. <laughs> anyway, uh, Joseph gets uh, reconciled with his father, and everything works out. So it's, it's beautiful. And the Joseph narrative is really a lesson about God's providence, that no matter what terrible things you might experience, that God has a plan. And Joseph maintained his faith in God through all the ups and downs of uh, this torturous story. And his faith is vindicated in the end where his family is reconciled and people are, are saved and kept alive and uh, so on. And so our psalm, Psalm 37, praises God for, uh, for caring for those um, uh, who trust in him. As it says here, the Lord watches over the lives of the wholehearted. Their inheritance lasts forever. Uh, the salvation of the justice from the Lord. He is their refuge in times of distress. All of that is illustrated by the uh, Joseph narrative. And then we get um, to our gospel reading, which is uh, Matthew 10. Excuse me, earlier I had said Mark, but this is, we are actually reading through Matthew at this time in the church calendar. And um, it has a very different character from um, from. Uh, the first reading. The first reading was full of 
peace and joy and reconciliation of the family. And our gospel reading is actually about dissension and betrayal in the family and about persecutions. So, uh, again, very different emotional mood than our first reading. Jesus says, Behold, I'm sending you out like sheep in the midst of wolves. And he describes how the apostles will be brought into court and tried for their faith and how they're not to worry about what they'll say because the Holy Spirit will give them what to say at the moment. And um, he warns against uh, about persecutions that they will experience even within the family. Brother will hand over brother to death and father his child and children will rise up against parents and have them be put to death. And you will be hated by all because of my name, but whoever endures to the end will be saved. So that's very sobering, this prediction from our Lord that severe family animosity will arise due to the Christian faith. And this remains true to this day, very sadly. Um, uh, very clear and pronounced forms of this are still happening happening in the 21st century under various atheist tyrannies that style themselves communist or socialist regimes, like in China or in North Korea, where the government uh, incentivizes people reporting on their own family members and reporting the religious practice of their family members uh, such that it has happened and continues to happen that Christian members of the family are reported to the government by their own relatives and then sent for re-education uh, and sometimes are tortured, sometimes die in these re-education uh, camps. And not only Christians, but followers of other religions as well. Uh, let's pray for them, even though they don't share our same faith. Nonetheless, they're being uh, unfairly persecuted. Uh, Uyghur Muslims, uh, followers of Falun Gong in China, uh, and then other places in the world as well, uh, in, in um, Muslim tyrannies where um, uh, Christianity is only marginally uh, tolerated. And historically, there have been terrible episodes of this under, under Lenin, under Stalin, in Russia, uh, under Hitler. Uh, and other uh, atheist tyrants uh, during the Spanish Revolution of the 20th century, uh, where in the Republican-controlled, so-called Republican-controlled parts of Spain, um, uh, Catholics were shot in the streets, um, thousands of priests and religious uh, killed, and again, incentives given f to report on your family members. So this is very current. And, and uh, it's important that we remember that our Lord said that this would happen because when we behold uh, uh, horrendous spectacles like the Spanish Revolution, the Bolshevik Revolution, um, you know, atheist uh, oppression in Cambodia and China and in so many different places uh, in the past uh, centuries, uh, we can think, oh, you know, the world is falling apart, or the faith is failing, or the church is failing, or has failed, and yet we should remember, Jesus told us that this would happen. Um, and and, and it, it, this could happen also in places that where presently there is religious freedom. Um, you know, we, we see warning clouds gathering in the United States, and in Canada, and uh, parts of Europe, etc., that a coming persecution, a hard persecution of, of Christians may arise, and there's already a sort of soft uh, persecution going on where increasingly uh, faithful practicing Christians are being marginalized socially, um, and we, we don't need to get into all of that. But we also see this, you know, this animosity in the family of, um, you know, brother handing over brother and father against child and children against parents. We see that also in softer ways in, uh, in, in struggles of the practice of the faith, of, of children leaving the faith and then raising the grandchildren to hate the Catholic Church that they're 
that their parents, that their grandparents once espoused. And sometimes it goes the other way. I'm a convert to Catholicism from a family that was Protestant. And we have this religious friction that ultimately has its roots in sin. And um, uh, there can be unwitting participants in these religion, religious divisions. Sometimes we inherit these divisions, but nonetheless, these divisions ultimately go back uh, to sin and to uh, certain people, sometimes us, not being obedient to Scripture, not following the Holy Spirit. But, but what does our Lord say? He who endures to the end will be saved. In this life, we are going to have persecutions. In this life, we may even have persecution within our own family. We may even experience a family dissension because of the faith, because of obedience to Jesus Christ. One brother may follow Christ, another brother may not, and it may become tense or harsh between them. Jesus said this was going to happen. We should not be surprised at it, and we should remember the lesson from our first reading, the lesson of Joseph. Joseph endured to the end. Joseph was a man of faith. Joseph was patient when he was persecuted by his brothers when he was sold into slavery, when he was falsely accused, all these things, he continued to practice virtue and he continued to put his faith to God in God. And ultimately, he was vindicated. And ultimately, we will be vindicated as well, if not in this life, in the life to come, because our hope is not in this life. Our hope is in eternal life with Christ that is to come. And this is the sobering reminder that our Lord uh, gives us and persecutions even serve God's providential uh, purposes. We to, to us, it may seem like the persecution is an evil thing, and yet in God's pers uh, purposes, these persecutions provide us opportunity to grow in holiness and to proclaim the gospel more widely than we otherwise might have been able to do. And so we need to have strong faith in God's providence. He knows what he's doing. Persecutions should not surprise us or shake our faith because Jesus told us that they would come and we should practice faith, patience, and endurance, as our Lord says, uh, so that in the end we will be saved. That is our bright uh, hope. And uh, every time we partake of the Eucharist, we have a foretaste of that salvation as we are united with Christ, body, blood, soul, and divinity, as we will be united with him forever in heaven. And so this has been Dr. John Bergsma for the St. Paul Center for Biblical Theology and Franciscan University of Steubenville coming to you on Friday of the 14th week of Ordinary Time. May your day be greatly blessed.